And welcome back inside the home office and welcome to this week's edition of NEC Women's Basketball on the Run. I'm Craig D'Amico. We welcome you to the final quarter of the NEC Women's Basketball regular season. All teams with either four or five games remaining in the regular season. These are the games that we really wait for all year. High stakes, high drama, and we have some big games coming up this week. Coming up on today's show, we will have a major update on the NEC Women's Basketball Playoff picture. We'll pick out the top stars from this past weekend of action. And we'll talk to really a player that we've been looking forward to talking to all season long. SFU's star first-year sensation, Kendall Carruthers, will be start stopping by the program. All that and more coming up. But first, let's get you caught up to speed on this week's top headlines. We start with our three-point shot. Now, before we go any further, full disclosure, Saturday night, I announced the Sacred Heart Wagner men's basketball game on ESPN Plus with Joe DeSantis. Great time. Flew from... Uh, Grimes Hill over to MetLife Stadium for the stadium series hockey game, Devils, Flyers. Uh, turns out sitting in 20 degree weather for three, four hours. Turns out that could get you sick. Who, who knew? Who, who knew that was possible? Uh, so I apologize in advance for the voice still on the mend, but we'll get power through it here on this episode. And uh, we'll start with our first headline and really want to take a quick snapshot look at the top three teams in the NEC standings. That's Sacred Heart, Lemoyne and FDU and see how their week went. And we start with Sacred Heart. They just had one game this past week. That was on Saturday, senior day at the Pitt Center against the Wagner Seahawks. They recognized Sajeda Bonner, Kelsey Wood uh, as their two senior players. Uh, Sacred Heart led that game 36 to 25 at the half, but Wagner came out of the locker room on a 10-0 run to get within a single point. But the Pioneers they withstood the charge. They went on a 16-5 to run over the next four minutes to go back up double figures, and then they just closed things out, dominating the fourth quarter, outscoring Wagner 24-11, to limiting the Seahawks to just two for nine shooting in the final 10 minutes. Sacred Heart would go on to win that game 79-55. to Nysera Pryor had 21 points. Amelia Wood had 17. So that's 38 of the 79 Pioneer points. Olivia Tucker added 18 as well as the Pioneers claim their seventh straight win. They've already clinched a playoff spot and now a first round home playoff game. And the 10 NEC wins that they've had this year have been by an average margin of victory of 19 points. Their lone loss to Lemoyne back on January 15th was only a four point loss. And you think that may have, uh, uh, you know, maybe stung them a little bit, maybe got them a little extra motivated that one loss. They haven't lost since. They've won seven in a row, again, dominating the competition. Now, speaking of the Dolphins, Lemoyne clinched a playoff spot to their first ever NEC tournament, and they clinched a first-round home playoff game. So not only will they get a first-ever tournament game, it'll be their first-ever home tournament game. They also reached 10 conference wins by putting together a pair of road victories over Central Connecticut and Stonehill. First on Thursday against the Blue Devils, the Dolphins went 19 for 20 from the free throw line. They had five players finishing in double figures. It was one of their most efficient games of the entire season as LeMoyne came away with a 69-54 to win. Now on a side note, we mentioned last week, Belle Lamfer for the Blue Devils, she needed 16 points to get to 1,000 for her career. Well, she got exactly 16 points with a basket in the final seconds to get to the milestone. She becomes the 18th Blue Devil, the first since Kiana Patterson uh, back in 2018-2019 to reach uh, 1,000 points. She's the fifth active NEC player to get to the 1,000-point mark. But then Saturday, LeMoyne, they come back against Stonehill, matchup of the NEC's two newest programs, and they beat the Skyhawks by 11. LeMoyne held Stonehill's Jada Thornton, one of their top scorers, to just five points, none in the first half. They out-rebounded the Skyhawks by 10, including 17 offensive rebounds, holding Stonehill just 44 points for the entire game. With the back-to-back -back wins last week, LeMoyne again clinches a playoff spot, first-round home game. Mary Grimes, their head coach, has now reached 50 career wins, and she's led uh, the Dolphins to 10 or more conference wins all three years that she's been the head coach. And finally, don't look now, 
But here come the two-time reigning regular season champion, the FDU Knights. FDU, they stretched their win streak to four in a row with a pair of rather convincing wins this past week against LIU, 84-53, to a 31-point victory. And then on the road at St. Francis, 68-48, to a 20-point win. Now, it was for FDU the, the, what's becoming a traditional trip to St. Francis, having to deal with snow, having to deal with a bus breaking down, and then coming out and dominating on defense and drilling threes. That All those things happened last year, and they forced 21 turnovers, got 20 points off turnovers, drilled seven threes, and held the red flash to 38% shooting with four players in double figures. This year, same result. Yes, the snow and the bus and all that, but... 11 points off red flash turnovers. They hit eight threes, which was more than last year. They held St. Francis to 36% shooting, which was better than last year. They again had four players in double figures. And again, St. Francis or FDU won rather convincingly. Now in both games this year, or this weekend, I should say, against LIU and against St. Francis, FDU held their opponents to single digits in both the first quarter and the second quarter against the Sharks, five points allowed in the first quarter, nine points allowed in the second quarter, while scoring over 20 points in each of those quarters themselves. And then on the on the other game, they allowed seven points in the first quarter to St. Francis, six points in the second quarter to the Red Flash. That's how you, you win games. Play defense early on while stretching your lead. FDU, they are now officially in the NEC tournament for a 10th straight season. That's how it looks at the top of the standings. We'll have more on those three teams and the rest of the playoff picture coming up in just a little bit. But let's get to headline number two. And we want to talk really about the game of the weekend. It was Saturday afternoon in Brooklyn, New York as the Merrimack Warriors were visiting the Shark Tank to take on the LIU Sharks. LIU, they would lead by eight at intermission, 31-23. to 23. Now, I'm not sure what Coach Marone said at halftime for Merrimack, but whatever she said, it worked. The Warriors came out of the break on a 10-1 run. They'd outscore LIU 21-10 to 10 in the third, setting up a fantastic finish in the fourth. There was... Five lead changes in the final three minutes. These two teams seesawing back and forth. LIU is up one with 100 seconds to go. Diamond Christian for the Warriors hit a three to put the Warriors up two. It was set up by a DeCesare drive and kick out to Christian, who was wide open at the top of the key, and she did her thing. Diamond was the Warriors' best friend in that situation. Now, with Merrimack up three in the final 25 seconds, Ashley Austin had her turn to come up clutch. Stone cold Ashley Austin with the game tying three to even the game up at 59. Then off a timeout, Merrimack had the possession and it was Swaggy P. Freshman guard Paloma Garcia driving into the lane, putting up a shot from the NEC logo and it goes through for the lead with four and a half seconds to spare. Ashley Austin would then miss a jumper on the other end as time expired and the Warriors survive Brooklyn 61 to 59. Jamie DeCesare and Paloma Garcia were both in double-figure scoring for Merrimack with 12 and 11 points, respectively. Mariah Elohim led all scores for LIU. She had 21 points on the day. Now, Merrimack, they look to finish top four in the league standings for a third time in five years, and they're making their annual February move up the ladder. Last year, they won nine of their final 10 games, including a seven-game win streak during that stretch to finish uh, as one of the top seeds in the conference. This year, they've won four of their last five. So similarly to last season, February going quite swimmingly for the Merrimack Warriors. We'll see if that run can continue. So let's take a look at where things stand around the Northeast Conference at the moment. Sacred Heart, Lemoyne, and FDU have all officially clinched spots into this year's tournament field. Sacred Heart is 10 and 1. They are a half game better than Lemoyne, who's 10 and 2, and two games better than FDU, who's at 8 and 3. Both Sacred Heart and Lemoyne have clinched first round home playoff games. FDU hasn't quite clinched a top four spot yet. They can do that. Their magic number is two to clinch a first-round home playoff game. They're four up on fifth-ranked Central with five games to go. So the Knights can earn a home quarterfinal playoff for a third straight year as soon as this upcoming weekend if things go in their favor. Now, it's it's not official yet, but assuming Sacred Heart, LeMoyne, FDU 
are in the top four, that means there's just one more spot available for home court advantage in the first round. And this year, as we've talked about over the last few weeks, home court has been so crucial. Home teams in conference play this year are 34 and 18. It's a 65% home win percentage, which is up from the last couple seasons. Now, currently, Merrimack is in that fourth spot. They are seven and five. We talked about their great February run. They've won three of four in February, seven of their last nine overall. Their road game at St. Francis on Thursday night, it'll be their final road game of the season. So the schedule actually works out quite well for the Warriors. Their final road game is coming up on Thursday, and then they finish the regular season with three straight games at home. FDU, Sacred Heart, Wagner. Now, again, it's not the easiest schedule, but three straight games on their home court. If they do well in that stretch, they could very well earn more home games after that once the tournament goes. But that remains to be seen. The Warriors are currently two and a half games better than Central Connecticut, who's at fifth place at four and seven in conference play. And you know, again, we mentioned it the last week. Give credit to Central. They haven't finished that high in the standing since 2016. So if they could get fifth, sixth, it's be one of the best finishes that Central has had in quite some time. Now, St. Francis is four and eight, a half game back of the Blue Devils, three games back of Merrimack with four to go. Wagner is three and eight, currently in seventh place, just a half game better than LIU and Stonehill are tied for eighth at three and nine. And that's going to be an interesting battle to watch because this year only the top eight out of the nine NEC teams qualify for the tournament, meaning one team will be the odd team out. At the moment, that would be Stonehill because LIU won head-to-head -head back in January. So LIU at the moment has the head-to-head -head tiebreaker for that final spot. But they will meet again in the regular season finale, and that result could loom large. So hope you got all that. There'll be a quiz on that coming up later. Just kidding. I mean, we could just wait two and a half weeks and see how this all plays out. But the playoff picture starting to come together in full focus as we enter the final quarter of the regular season. Time now for the heat check featuring the top stars from this past week in NEC action. And we start at number three with a pair of players. Once again, a tie this week, Stacy Williams of FDU and Latoya Baker for the Lemoyne Dolphins. Williams first. She's really making a push to Sharpie her name onto the all rookie team when all is said and done. So great to see the improvement for this first year guard from North Carolina. She averaged 3.6 points per game in her first seven games in November, a shaky start. But she's averaged over nine points per game since, including this past weekend. She went a perfect four for four from behind the arc, finished with 12 points against LIU, and then shot seven for nine from the field, including three for three from behind the arc, finishing with 20 points and six rebounds on the road against St. Francis. So all in all, a perfect seven for seven from downtown. Now on the other side, Latoya Baker recorded a double-double, her third in a row at 17 points and 14 rebounds against Central Connecticut. And then she nearly extended the double-double streak to four. She had 11 points and nine rebounds two days later at Stonehill. She currently leads the league in rebounding and is sixth in the league in scoring. Our number two star is Nysera Pryor from the Sacred Heart Pioneers. Our top star from last week only had one game to really make a mark this week. That's probably why she slid down to number two, but she made the most of that one game going for 21 points, eight rebounds and six assists in Sacred Heart's 24 point senior day home victory over Wagner. Pryor recorded her 10th 20 point effort of the season and she regained the league's scoring lead, averaging 17.9 points per game. She's averaging 20.3 points in the month of February so far. And our number one star this week is Kendall Carruthers of the St. Francis Red Flash. The first year Red Flash guard started the weekend with a career high 32 points on Thursday night against Wagner. This coming after St. Francis had been off for the previous 12 days. So whatever she worked on for those 12 days, it worked. 32 points against Wagner. It was her second 30-point game of the season. Then on Saturday at home against FDU, Carruthers scored 15 points. She's currently fourth in the league in scoring, and she's averaging 20 and a half points per game in the month of February. So plenty of heat for you this week. In this week's heat check, Williams, Baker, Pryor, and Carruthers 
our top stars of the week in the NEC. And our number one star, Kendall Carruthers, is also our special guest in this week's NEC Open Mic. She's stopping by to talk about that smooth transition from her senior year in high school to a star first-year standout here in the Northeast Conference for the St. Francis Red Flash. It's time now for the NEC Open Mic, and our guest this week is a first-year guard for the 12-time NEC champion St. Francis Red Flash, a five-time Rookie of the Week. We welcome in Kendall Carruthers. Kendall, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, let's talk about this incredible start you're, you're on here. You're averaging close to 14 points per game, fourth in the league. So what's been the secret to making such a seamless jump from high school to college? I assume it's not easy and there's a lot of differences. So how have you been able to handle that transition so smoothly? Um, just staying confident um, during practice and during the games, putting the hard work in um, when people are watching and when people are not watching. Uh, that's what it's all about. Awesome. Now, recently, you guys had 12 days off, and then you came off those 12 days, and you exploded for 32 points against Wagner. So what did you do during those 12 days that worked so well? <laughs> uh, I worked with my uh, my coaches, um, Coach Z. We worked on different things, pull-ups, threes, and just stayed in the gym the whole time. Now, you're currently averaged about 20 points per game in February. Everybody wants to be playing their best at the end of the season, seeing that progression and that improvement over the course of the season. How have you been able to actually do it? Stay, stay confident, but I can't really do this without my teammates passing the ball, looking for me, and just having fun with my teammates. If you were going to assess yourself, is, is the Wagner game kind of stand out as your best overall game this year? Or do you have another game in mind that might have been your top? Um, probably LIU because I shot really well from the field range, even though it was a tough loss, but that was a really good game. And yeah, that was a really good game. Okay. So let's get into your basketball journey a little bit. How was it? When was it that you fell in love with the game of basketball way back when as a kid? Yeah, I actually started playing basketball in seventh grade, but I really didn't play that much. But my, like when I really fell in love was eighth grade year, my high school coach Clifton Hodges. I really love him because he'd been, he believed in me since I was young, so shout out to him. That's awesome. Um, so what 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 did you like about the team, Coach Whittington, that led you uh, coming to from Ohio to join the Red Flash? Uh, St. Francis has a very great uh, program. They're used to winning, so I came here to win and learn from a great coach. Um, I'm sure you know it's it's the dream to to play Division One basketball. So what was it like that first game, Robert Morris back in November, coming out in the red flash uniform, taking the court for that first game? I was really nervous the first game, but like you said, it was always a dream for me to play Division One basketball. So I just had to think about all the work I put in, and I'm now here playing Division One. So uh, let's talk about the team for a second. Uh, four and eight in conference play with four games still to go. So what does the team need to do to kind of make a late charge here as we get towards March? Um, staying confident and staying hungry. Um, knowing that the games we lost, we still have to try even more harder against the teams that we uh, lost to. We just got to keep forward, keep like our head forward and stay hungry. And you mentioned it because coming up this weekend, you're playing Merrimack Stonal back to back. And we'll see you Saturday, 4 p.m. on ESPN Plus for a TV game against the Skyhawks. But you lost to them both on the road earlier this year. This time they're coming to your home court. So what needs to be different? Um, we have to have more energy and uh, out hustle the teams we're playing. The last the teams that we're about to play uh, this coming up week, they out hustled us um, on the rebounds and on the glass the whole time. So we have to have more energy to them and play smarter. All right, we're looking forward to seeing that play out again. St. Francis and Stonehill coming up on Saturday on ESPN+. Plus. But it's time now for the final five questions. Kendall, these are quick hitters. First thing that comes to your mind, just let it out, all right? <laughs> all right, favorite snack or junk food? Uh, Welch's fruit snacks. Ooh, okay. Favorite color? Orange. Okay, any pregame superstitions? Um, probably praying, I guess. Okay. What is one thing that you cannot live without? Basketball. There you go. And finally, if we took a survey of all your teammates, what is a trait or an adjective that they might use to describe you? Um, bucket getter. Okay. That's a, hey, that's important. You've been getting a lot of buckets recently. Again, averaging 20 points per game in February. So keep it up. Great freshman season so far. I wish you the best of luck uh, here down the stretch. Thank you so much.
All right, we'll see Kendall in the red flash against Merrimack Thursday and then on ESPN Plus Saturday against Stonehill. Be sure to check out the full episode of NEC Women's Basketball on the run on the NEC Overtime Pod. It's available now wherever you get your podcasts. We thank Kendall for stopping by, and we look forward to watching her on the Red Flash in action this weekend. We know that there's two and a half weeks left in the regular season. Some teams have four games left. Others have five. But all teams are jockeying for seeding and positioning in this year's NEC tournament. So let's check out what's coming up this week on tap. And we start on Thursday with the Red Flash hosting Merrimack. It's Merrimack's final road game of the season. They finish with three straight at home. Now, Merrimack beat St. Francis in their first ever NEC tournament playoff game last year in the quarterfinals. They beat St. Francis pretty good, 71 to 48 earlier this year, back on January the 27th in Massachusetts. But if they can beat them again this time, the Warriors would book a return ticket to the NEC tournament for a second straight year. Jamie DeCesare and uh, Talia Shepard were both over 20 points in that first meeting. Merrimack went over 70 points for just the fifth time this year, and Merrimack did it without the, really the benefit of a three. They were only two for 15 from behind the arc in that game, which was somewhat uncharacteristic. So we'll see what happens in Loretto in the rematch. Also, Wagner will take on Central Connecticut State. The Blue Devils are two and a half games behind Merrimack with five to go for a top four spot in the standings. Wagner, they're just one game back of Central, and they defeated Central 49-45 to back on January 27th. It, that, now, we talked a couple of weeks ago, and Samora said it. That was her worst game of the season, and she kind of felt it during warm-ups that things were not quite in sync. She only had six points on two for 18 shooting. So we'll see how she rebounds the second time around facing Wagner. Now, uh, despite Watson's struggles, that game earlier this year between Wagner and Central, it still came down to a potential game-tying three in the final seconds that wouldn't go down. So it's still a close game the first time around, even without Watson putting up big scoring numbers. So we'll see what happens in this Wagner-Central rematch. Now, how about LIU and LeMoyne? For the Dolphins, a first-ever NEC tournament berth and a first-round quarterfinal home game already locked up. So right now, it's all about keeping pace with Sacred Heart for a potential regular season title. They're a half game back. LeMoyne beat LIU in Brooklyn 80-62 to earlier in the season, shooting over 50%. That was Ashley Austin's first game back off of her hiatus due to injury. LIU, they've lost three straight and seven of their last eight. Seven straight games they've lost in conference. So LIU is trending in the wrong direction. And right now they're just in a battle to make the NEC tournament. So this is a big game for LIU. And then finally, we wrap up our Thursday schedule with Sacred Heart and FDU. The last time Sacred Heart was on the banks of the Hackensack, I'm sure they remember it well. They were cutting down the nets last March in the NEC championship game. And you got to believe that stepping back into that gym will bring back all the memories. Sacred Heart, they're on a roll. They've won seven in a row, six of those seven by at least 15 points, but they say a good defense can beat a good offense, and FDU in league play, they only allow 58 points per game. They hold opponents shooting just 38%. FDU has won four in a row and six of their last seven. Their only loss during the seven-game stretch was at Sacred Heart, 68 to 51 back on January 27. Now, a key for FDU in this game is to hold Sacred Heart under 70. If they continue to shoot well, they can't get off to slow starts like we've seen, you know, in the, in the past. They they shot 42% the last time they played Sacred Heart. So continue to shoot well, play their defense, hold Sacred Heart under 70. Don't turn the ball over. First time they met, they had 18 turnovers, which led to 23 Sacred Heart points. And, you know, those turnovers leading to the transition, that plays right into Sacred Heart's hand. So if FDU can shore those things up, still shoot well and not turn the ball over, play defense, they, they have a shot. They have the momentum, certainly. Sacred Heart has momentum as well. So we'll see what happens in this championship game rematch on Thursday night. And finally, on Saturday, Sacred Heart following that FDU game will be on the road at Central Connecticut, the Blue Devils hung in there the first time these two teams played, falling by only five points. This time, Central wrapping up a three-game homestand by welcoming in 
the Pioneers. Now, if Sacred Heart wins both games this week against FDU and Central, they would get to 12-1, and which would be their best conference start since 13-0 and on their way to a perfect conference season back in 2009. Now, FDU, they will follow up that Sacred Heart game by welcoming in the second-place team in the league. LeMoyne, FDU, starting to look like a contender, but now this weekend, we'll find out how true of a contender they are. They welcome the top two teams in the league to their home court. Now, FDU had the unfortunate task of finding out firsthand that LeMoyne was not the you know last place team that was forecasted in the preseason coaches poll that LeMoyne was for real because FDU had the unfortunate task of playing LeMoyne on opening night back in January and LeMoyne beat them 65-52. It was the Dolphins' first ever conference game. So now there's a little bit more tape on it on LeMoyne uh, against conference opponents. So we'll see the adjustments that FDU makes this time around. Both teams know that they could be at home in the quarterfinal round. So LeMoyne FDU could very well be a semifinal preview for the NEC tournament coming up down the road. FDU just a game and a half behind LeMoyne for a number two spot. If FDU can win this one, they'd only be a half game back and they would have forced a split. Uh, so certainly FDU can creep closer to maybe being a number two seed if they can win one or even both of their games this weekend. Now, Wagner will also be at LIU, two of the teams in the fight just to make the tournament. Wagner beat LIU 75-66 back in early January. But our feature game on Saturday will be 4 p.m. ESPN+. Plus. Myself, Joe DeSantis, will be on the call. The Stonehill Skyhawks taking on the St. Francis Red Flash. We will be in DeGaulle Arena, the mystique and the aura of that place. I love walking in there every single time. All the memories of all the great players, great teams can come flooding back to you. My first NEC championship game was in that building 20 years ago, back in 2004. Now here we are in 2024, 20 years later. So uh, a pleasure for me just to uh, be at the Gall Arena once again, all the history in that place. Love it. Now, in the present day, St. Francis, five years ago, they were the reigning champions. They were playing in a championship game. And now, just five short years later, they're looking to avoid setting an unfortunate program record uh, with a 24 loss season. That's a single season. That would be the single season record for most losses in a season. So, certainly. Uh, quite a change in just five years. Now, since 1996, St. Francis hasn't gone more than seven seasons without winning a championship. They're currently in their sixth season since their last title back in 2019. So they seem to be far away from those days of you know 2018, 2019. But Kendall Carruthers, who we talked to earlier, she can be the one to get the Red Flash program back on track. And it only takes one, one player to, to, you know, light the spark. We, we You look at St. Francis, things kind of went awry early on. The two players they brought to media day back in October, Caitlin Maxwell, Destiny Ward, coach talking about their leadership. They'll be the strength of the team this year. Well, both those players are out due to injury. So things kind of went awry early. The young team kind of had to grow up in a hurry. Kendall Carruthers, has certainly led the way. She's looking to be SFU's first rookie of the year since Caitlin Kroll back in 2018. Now, on the other side for Stonehill, Trisha Brown, she's in her 23rd year, and this year will be the first time in 23 years that she suffered back-to-back sub-500 seasons. She's she's not used to, to being in this type of situation, but it was somewhat expected nine newcomers on the roster for the Skyhawks this year as they're trying to build on the fly and clinch a spot in their first ever NEC tournament while also playing the long game and try to get their roster ready for the first year they're eligible for the NCAA tournament in 2026-2027. Now, this will be my first time calling a Skyhawks game and seeing them live in person. I'm excited because... They've played close games. 15 of their 28 conference games since joining the league have been decided by eight points or less, including an overtime game between these two same schools last year in Loretto. Now, Stonehill won by nine when these two teams played earlier the year in January. Currently, St. Francis just one game ahead of Stonehill as these two teams look to avoid being that lone team left out of this year's postseason party. So we look forward to it Saturday afternoon, 4 p.m., Stonehill, St. Francis on ESPN+. 
And that'll do it for this week's show. Enjoy the games, everyone. I will talk to you on Saturday from Loretto on ESPN+. And, of course, we'll talk to you again right back here next week. Until then, I'm Craig D'Amico, and this has been NEC Women's Basketball on the Run.